And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, <clears throat> saying, it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. And that's from Matthew 14, 26 of the King James Version. I welcome everybody on this special, beautiful Sunday. It's a beautiful day the Lord has made. Um, it's the day before Halloween, which is a very special day because it's when the spiritual ones are said to be closer to earth, which is going to help us today. <laughs> <laughs> so let us appear to others as we would have them appear to us. And uh, you know that I like the lighter side of things, so I'm going to do a little wisdom, a little humor and wisdom and a joke or two. Why did the ghost? Uh, why did the ghost go into the bar? For the booze. <laughs> what is, what's in a ghost's nose? Boogers. <laughs> That's bad. How do you know when you've been ghosted? The poltergeist just doesn't text you back. <laughs> why do vampires not want to become investment bankers? They hate stakeholders. <laughs> what do you call a cleaning skeleton? The grim, the grim sweeper. <laughs> How do you get rid of demons? Exercise a lot. <laughs> and why was a cemetery chosen to be the perfect location to write a movie? Because it had great plots. <laughs> I awaken in the Halloween aftermath, bed covered in candy wrappers. Looking down at my chocolate smeared hands, I whisper, what have I done? What have I done? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and join me now in invocation. Father, Mother God, Holy Spirit, as we join together here in fellowship, thankful for this beautiful place that you provided us surrounded with your golden white protective light and love as we ask our angels, guides, masters, and all those highest beings of the highest vibration to join us now and assist us as we speak with those in spirit and share thy word with, with blessings and unconditional love for all. We pray that you may touch all world leaders with the spirit of cooperation and our unconditional love for peace and have them to desire to work together for all humanity. We also ask a special blessing today for peace throughout all nations and for all our loved ones, whether they are here with us or in spirit. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Good morning. I think everyone here knows me. I'm the Reverend Rick Webster. And uh, we're going to have a great uh, day today with some fun and a lot of good messages. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. And since you are, I'll speak about Halloween. So I'm going to speak about the Halloween Day of the Dead and spiritualism. And uh, we'll see how all of it fits in together. The first known celebration of Halloween began about 2,000 years ago with a festival that was known as Salem. It was a Celtic celebration in the area in the parts of Great Britain and France. The festival occurred during the harvest at the beginning of winter. The Celtic New Year began on November 1st and the Celtic belief that on the eve of the New Year, but the ghosts of the dead at this time were able to return to earth. The presence of these spirits from the other side, they believe, would be in a, in the, instrumental in making it much easier for Druids to make their predictions for future events. These prophecies provided much uplifting for them, especially considering the nasty cold and the dark winters, and also gave them guidance during that time to help them through. The Druids constructed large bonfires, and many people came. They were dressed in costumes that it made from skins, fur, heads, and horns of animals in an effort to make the sacrifices that would please the Celtic gods. 
At the completion of the celebration, they would take a burning ember from a sacred fire to light their own personal hearth, believing that the sacred fire would protect them during the long cold winters. The Roman Empire invaded and conquered the Celts, and the Romans then decided to combine two of their own festivals with the Celtic Samhain festival. One Roman festival was called Heralia, which occurred in late October when the Romans commem commemorated the passing of their dead. The second festival honored the Roman goddess of fruit and trees, who was known as the Noma. After the Catholic Church took over the Roman Empire, the pagan celebrations were disbanded, and they replaced them with their own celebration known as All Martyrs Day. Then in 609 AD, Pope Boniface IV decided to dedicate the Roman Pantheon to honor all Christian martyrs. And then later on, the festival was expanded by Pope Gregory III to include all of the saints. The date of the festival was changed from May the 13th to November the 1st. I had no idea about that. <clears throat> Christianity had spread across Europe by 800 AD. The church had now made November the second All Saints All Souls Day to honor the dead. Again, All Souls Day was a festival celebrated with large bonfires and ornate parades. It was customary to dress in costume as an angel, a saint, a devil, or something similar. This became known as All Hallows or Al O Hallamus. And the night before was called All Hallows Eve. This evolved into what we all know now as Halloween. Similarly, trick or treating was also likely tied to a term souling, a British practice that emerged in the Middle Ages and lasted until about 1930. Souling was a ritual in which children and needy people dressed in costumes and they would knock on doors begging. And according to an early 19th century song, these soldiers wanted an apple, a, a pear, a plum, or a cherry, or anything good to make us all merry. They were most interested in soul cakes, which were small round confections, flavored with sweet spices and decorated with raisins or currants that were arranged in a cross design. These cakes were blessed by priests and were distributed in honor of the dead. And still in bakeries, they make those hot cross buns uh, that you see that have the white icing cross on them and they're raising them and they're absolutely delicious. <clears throat> <clears throat> Using a white sheet with cut out eye holes, the homemade ghost is the most common Halloween costume. This practice was rooted in a morbid ritual, the burial of the dead. Wooden coffins at one time were a luxury in the United Kingdom. In lieu of expensive caskets, the poor would simply wrap and bury their loved ones in winding sheets or white shrouds that evolved into ghost costumes. Dressing up as a witch was also a popular costume. They were characterized by a pointy black hat and a not so pretty face. <laughs> Our modern image of the witch is actually based on the crone, who is a pagan goddess that was commemorated during Sam, um, Salem. Though, entered in, though initially known for her wisdom and role in rebirth, the mistress of the underworld is now associated with broomsticks and black cats. In turn, these symbols are respectively devoted from the makeshift walking sticks and popular pets that accused witches were known for during the ages. Glowing jack-o'-lanterns have become a common Halloween feature. Today, pumpkins are carved, but originally, jack-o'-lanterns were made from turnips. Using the root vegetable as a lantern dates back to medieval Britain. As people went door to door asking for soul cakes and other treats, they carried ho hollowed out turnips with a candle placed inside. These lit their paths as they traveled from one house to house, 
steeped in symbolism. <coughs> the covered candles inside represented souls that were stuck in purgatory. Historians connect this concept to the will of the wisp folklore. According to the Irish legend, <clears throat> the will of the wisp is a ghostly light. And according to one tale, this light is made up of embers from hell and was placed inside a hollowed out turnip by a character named Jack, who's who was stuck in limbo and used this lamp as an effort to seek out a final resting place. And inspired by this story, people in Ireland began carrying jack-o'-lanterns to celebrate Halloween. Eventually, the tradition made its way to North America, where pumpkins were more available, and that's how we got there. In Mexico, people celebrate Dia de los Muertos, which is a festival of celebration and remembrance of friends and family who have died and embarked on their spiritual journey into the afterlife. It's also known in our language as the Day of the Dead. <clears throat> it is one of the most historically and cultural events in the Mexican heritage. <clears throat> Dia de los Muertos actually refers to November 2nd, when, when deceased adults are honored. On, the, on, the, on November 1st, Dia de los Encintos, the Day of the Innocents, or Dia de los Angelitos, the Day of the Little Angels, is reserved for the babies and children who have passed away. October 31st is the day that we set aside for preparation of Dia de los Muertos. And it encompasses the entire three day feast. The two day festival is a modern continuum of ancient Aztec rituals to honor those who have died. The traditions and rituals of the day of the dead are very within regions. The celebration starts with the creation of an altar, which participants will fill with colorfully decorated skeletons and cheerful poses. That's right, cheerful poses. There is food, trinkets, and other offerings on the table, as well as personal and religious items, as well as favorite foods of the deceased. The altars were dedicated to their loved ones in spirit with the intent that the spirits will bless them and assist them in their continuing spiritual journey in the afterlife. The festival celebrators believe that death is something that should be celebrated in a lively way and not something to be afraid of. We as spiritualists also believe and demonstrate the continuity of life. The various rites and rituals of the Day of the Dead go back to post-classic period between 1300 and 1521 of the pre-Columbian Mexico. This was an age when the Aztec Empire flourished. Most Mesoamerican peoples along with the Aztecs considered grief as disrespectful to their dead. Instead of mourning their loved ones, they chose to festively celebrate their dead, which became the beginning of the Day of the Dead. The Aztecs welcomed visits from beyond the grave. During this month-long festival, worshiped the mythical goddess of the underworld, who was known as Mictica Sawatl. And I'm not sure that pronunciation. <laughs> That's a little tough one. <laughs> who was historically known as the Lady of the Dead. Originally, the celebration was celebrated during the ninth month of the Aztec calendar, which was August. This changed with the invading conquistadors during the 16th century, who brought Catholic influences, shifting the celebration to its current date. With the onset of the Spanish colonization who brought Catholic influences, the Day of the Dead was modified. All Hallowed Tide was another holiday honoring the dead that was inspired by pagan harvest festivals. They were all combined into a three-day festival comprising All Hallows' Eve or Halloween. 
on October 31st. All Saints Day on November 1st, and All Souls Day on November the 2nd. The Catholic influence altered and changed the religions aspect of the festival, but it still retains its Aztec mythology. La Calavera Contrina, who was a secular female skeleton character, has come to represent Didia Los Muertos and was inspired by Mictica Sawato. That's a hard one to take. <laughs> <laughs> the festival and made its most prominent by the ofrenda, which is the offering. On the day of the dead, the ofrenda or offering is placed on a ritual altar. The altars are the centerpieces of the celebration and they can be found in private homes, cemeteries, churches, and their purpose is to welcome the dead back to the earth for this three day event. Although the Day of the Dead usually compares to Halloween, it is not Halloween and is not supposed to scare anyone. It does not revolve around mischief, trick or treating, or the more more morbidity of death. Rather, it celebrates the dead as illustrated in festive decorations. Colorfully painted skulls, such as this right here, which come from Mexico. And skeletons enjoying activities such as playing music, spirited food, and drink, respected photographs, symbolic candles, and thoughtful trinkets. The decorations are honored those who have passed, and they include bright colors and, and incorporate playful skull, skull motives. Many objects of art were made of tissue paper, known as paper mache, and uh, they called it chiseled paper there. These are flag-like folk, similar to the pre-Columbian version, made from tree bark. These were used by the Aztecs to adorn religious sites and making their codices. I'll stop here for a minute and just show you a few pictures of uh, some of the Day of the Dead celebration dressing. You can see there's a lot of color in it and a lot of fun mm -hmm. as they dress up to celebrate. Ofrendas are also objects made with freshly cut Flor de Muerto which is a bright orange and yellow marigolds made to cheer up the dead with brilliant colors and a floral scent. The scent of the marigold is thought to lead spirits back from the cemetery to their family home. That's interesting. Monarch butterflies represent the soul of the departed. Colorful skulls made of molded sugar paste known as calaveros or another popular decoration on Day of the Dead. Small skulls are beautifully decorated with motifs such as flowers and spider webs, and they feature sometimes the names of the dead, which are written in foil or icing on their foreheads. Some calaveras feature both inedible ornaments like beads, sequins, and feathers, while others are made to be eaten. They call them sugar skulls, and everybody liked them. Sugar skulls represent the departed soul often having the name of the deceased written on the forehead, placed on a home, a friend, or gravestone to welcome and honor the return of a particular spirit. Sugar skull art reflects a folk art featuring big happy smiles, colorful icing, sparkling tin, and shining, glittering adornments. The sugar skulls, or calavera, which come in different sizes and they're made of sugar and are decorated with icing to be fun and colorful and they taste like candy. Some have feathers, glitter, hats, or other objects attached, which makes them more personal. Sugar skulls aren't morbid. They represent the continuing cycles of life and death. The colors of the skull and the face paints have specific meanings. Yellow is used to depict the spirit and purity. 
White is used to depict, oh no, yellow represents the sun in unity, I'm sorry. Because under the sun, we are all the same. White is used to depict the purity and, and uh, support free thinking journalism and subscribe to independent minds. Red represents life, or more specifically, the blood of life. Purple represents the understandable mourning that is felt by those who lose loved ones, and pink signifies happiness. Another nice feature of the Day of the Dead altar is traditionally covered with edible offerings that were enjoyed by the deceased person in their previous lives. Also, most of them this include Don de Bonetto and spirited drinks. This bread of the dead is a type of sweet roll. It is decorated with foam like decorations and flavored with anise seeds, which taste like licorice. An orange zest. I'm not sure what the orange zest is. With this and other various offerings of food, it's believed that the uh, visiting spirits absorb and enjoy the essence of the pandem muerto. And fortunately, it is the living who physically consume it. To help the spirits relax and enjoy their festivities, people will often offer alcoholic beverages like tequila, mezcal, and polk, a drink made out of fermented agave sap. Guess who consumes these? <laughs> it's not the spirits. <laughs> <laughs> Photographs that identify who each ofrenda is dedicated to are placed about the altar. And the photos are usually of a family member, a friend, or a favored celebrity, or even a beloved pet. I like that. Candles also memorize, memorialize the dead and symbolically help them to find their way back to the altar. They are many times placed in cross formation to evoke the crucifix and also to serve as a compass so the spirits can orient themselves. At other times, the arrangement is a choice of the family. For a personal touch to the altar, participants will add objects that belonged to or were previously enjoyed by their beloved dead ones, such as favorite clothing, cigarettes, and for children, their toys. Statuettes of saints and other religious figures are popular also, as are the paper mache and clay figurines of skeletons. You can see the Catholic influence here also in some of the things in these rituals. Today of the Day of the Dead remains a major event in Mexican culture, both in Mexico as well as beyond. In addition to making altars and attending citywide festivals, today people often celebrate Dia de los Muertos by dressing up to look like Calaveras, which has inspired countless Halloween costumes. Many still follow the ancient traditions, believing as the Celts and those of Mexico that Halloween is a time when the veil thins between the worlds of the living and the dead. This resonates with the beliefs of spiritualism and that we practice communication with those in spirit. <clears throat> and it's a great thing to do that. <laughs> as spiritualists, we believe in the continuity of life and in communication with spirits such as well the belief that the spirit does not die and the personality survives death. We believe that when physical body dies, the spirit returns to the spiritual world from whence it came. Many of us embrace the beliefs in reincarnation and the continuing cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. It would be difficult to believe that in a universe that had no beginning and no ending, that God would create beings to live less than a short hundred years, just to spend an eternity being punished for mistakes. We all know that some people take longer than others. <laughs> Souls often learn by participating in a material body and experiencing. We have to live to be able to experience. Experiencing life, what is a mortal soul experiences while incarnate within a physical body. 
My talk tonight was designed to bring light to the fact that basically all peoples of the world at various and diversified as they may be, believe in some type of afterlife. Life is eternal. John 4, 14, King James verses, Jesus said, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Alchemically, water symbolizes consciousness or mind. In Matthew eleven fifteen, Jesus said, He that his ears to hear, let him hear. And I extend to you my blessings and unconditional love. Thank you. May let us prepare for meditation. Okay. Let us begin to relax, separating our feet and our hands placed in our lap. Let us feel the energy in the room as we take a nice, long, deep breath and hold it briefly and then release any negativity that we may be holding in our body. Let us take a second nice, long, deep breath, bringing in all that is positive. Hold it briefly and release negative negativity, blocks, anything negative, anything that bothers us, let it go. We take a third long, deep breath, bringing in the light, bringing in the eternal light. And we release it, releasing everything, all thoughts, all emotions, all feelings, just let it go as we relax and feel the peace as we are surrounded by the golden white light and protected. Feel the peace. Feel how wonderful it is to set in this beautiful light and allow the energy to come up through the floor. Feel a tingling coming through the bottom of your feet it feels good and refreshing as it continues up through the ankle, up through the lower legs, up through the knees, relaxing, releasing all tension. Allow the energy to come on up past the knees, up and through to the thighs, and up through the hip area. Again, relaxing, releasing all pain. Allow that energy to come on up, on up through the lower intestinal area, on up through the stomach and liver area, refreshing all of our organs as it comes through us. And as it starts to continue up the back of the spine, just feel it one at a time, going up each vertebrae. On up, up through the lower lung area. As it goes up through the lung area, it pushes out all the negativity and stale air. Allow it to do that as it comes on up and up. And it comes up through the heart area, a beautiful area. An area full of love and green or pink light. Feel that love and that unconditional love that is present there. And allow the energy to come on up, on up through the lungs. As it comes up to the shoulders and through the shoulder blades, the shoulder blades just relieve, relief. They just release and relax as you kind of melt into the chair, 
more and more comfortable. Feel that energy. And the energy continues down the upper arm as it continually slowly goes to the elbow, relieving tension on down the forearms to the wrist, relieving all the stress and tension of daily work. And it goes through the hands and pushes out all the negativity through the fingertips and the palms of the hands. And now we pick up the energy again as the light continues up through the neck area. As it relieves the stress of continually talking and losing our voice, it goes on up, up through the jaw area of the head and not through the back of the head. You might feel your hair tingling as the energy and white light continues up the back of the head, past the ears, on up to the crown chakra. But we have a beautiful connection with the white light. And allow it to continue on around the forehead and on around the a spot between the eyes at the base of the nose. This is the third eye. Beautiful amethyst colors. Allow the third eye to open. You might feel a little thumping or a little pressure as the third eye energizes. It is wonderful, wonderful feeling. And as we are sitting here, we now see ourselves out walking on a beautiful fall day. It's a beautiful day. The leaves are out. You hear the leaves crunching below your feet. And occasionally, a squirrel or some kind of animal rustling through the leaves before you. There's a slight breeze that's cool, but it's still warm for all day. The sun is bright and the beautiful blue, blue sky and white clouds are above you. You continue on this path, on slightly up the hill. As you walk, you become a little tired. It's a long walk as you walk. And you see right up ahead, there's a bench where you can sit. So you go over and you sit on this bench and lean back and kind of drift into the spirit world. And with a few minutes, you hear some leaves rustling and someone sits down beside you and you turn to them and you're surprised that you recognize the face because it is a loved one who is in spirit, who has been there for some time. It's that special person that you miss the most. And for now, I'm going to leave them and you together to enjoy a visit for a few minutes. We only have a few moments to share. I'll be back.
now it is time that we return and you bid your your loved one farewell for now and you stand up and begin walking and you walk and you walk and now you're back in the room and you feel the presence in the room you begin to feel your hands and feet tingling as you're back in your body. And you take a nice long deep breath and you're wide awake and feeling good. Wide awake, feeling good. Wide awake and feeling good. And let there be light. <laughs>